and I realized how little people understand the mechanics of how a petroleum economy works. The non-booming tradable sector contracted because the appreciation of the real effective exchange rate led to an increase in external uncompetitiveness of the Trinidad and Tobago economy and the sector lost workers to the non-tradable sector in the second instance and the booming tradable sector in the first instance. The booming tradable sector also becomes more peaked. This is reason in terms of the underlying theory for the expansion and the, the whole boom in the economy in the first place. I would have shown some of you all this graph probably about a month ago who logged on. I did a comparison of 1999 and 2018 of all the sectors in the economy. And one of the things you, you, you notice is that there was contraction across the board in all of these sectors, except in two main sectors, one, two, two, which is something associated with beverage. Which is 343, which is something associated with gas. Now, in terms of the changes moving ahead, I, there, there are other te technocrats on this panel, so I'm sticking only to some basic macroeconomic ones, those in energy and, and finance, and otherwise, other people will come in. The level of real GDP has fallen in the recent past, and I, I would have mentioned before in the public domain that in 2016, Trinidad Tobago was the sixth worst performing economy in the world. In 2017, we were the 12th worst performing economy in the world. In 2018, we were the 16th worst performing economy in the world. 2019 data is not officially out as yet. So I will wait for that data to be officially out. But according to Standard & Poor, it was minus 0.2%. The balance of payments continues to be in, in, in primarily in deficit. The, the, the primary balance as a percent of GDP remains persistently in deficit. The stock of gross reserves has generally declined. The country's ease of doing business ranking has worsened. Murders per capita has been fairly buoyant, which is something we will need to try and reverse. And the labor force participation rate in the economy has, 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 um, has worsened. Now, <clears throat> you know, I posted this graph on one of the chat group I'm involved in today. And it shows real GDP in China and Tobago, how it declined from 1983 and remained below the level of 1982 until about 1996. And then increased fairly quickly in the context of the petroleum boom um, until about 2008 and remained at and around that level until about 2014 and then basically fell off a cliff almost to 2020. In that same time period, we moved from producing about 2.5 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent to about 10.5 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent, or we produced about 10 billion barrels of oil and gas, about 8 billion barrel gas. And if one were to take the analysis from 2008 to 2020, we had a fall in GDP of about 16%, and in that same time period, we produced approximately 4 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent. And this, this should bother everyone on this chart. Because I am basically saying to you, we fell 16% in GDP in, in terms of real terms. And our we produced about 4 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent. So 4 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent and contraction in economic activity. That's nonsense. And we now have to recalibrate this economy in perhaps the most trying time the global economy has seen in the last 100 years. Here is the Chicago and Tobago case of active corona, um, the Chicago and Tobago situation with active corona cases and the Venezuela situation shown on the right hand side of the graph. Um, and, you know, even to me, I am not a medical expert, but it, it, was, it was obvious that if it is, Venezuela has an exploding active case scenario with COVID-19 and Trinidad and Tobago has a relatively open border with relation to, 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 to Venezuela in terms of an illegal order, then there's a high probability that there will be a spillover. I also did a simple variance composition along with one of the hosts of this conversation, Rebecca Gopul, using CARICOM GDP as a dependent variable and uh, as other part of a variance composition exercise, I use US GDP, EU 27 GDP, 
China, uh, the GDP of China, the GDP of the UK, and the GDP of CARICOM. And we found that 51.7% of the variation in GDP in CARICOM was on account of variation in the US GDP. And we all know that the US GDP, if you see it here, is projected to contract about 8% in 2020. So if it is you have a high proportion of the variation in GDP in the Caribbean region being on account of the change in GDP in the USA, and the GDP in the USA is collapsing by minus 8% for 2020 forecasted according to the IMF, then the collapse of the Trinidad Tobago economy in 2020 would be, would be real. And moving into 2021, the lingering effects, and I don't think we are on to a second wave of COVID-19 as yet. I think this is part of the first wave triggered by the, the, the borders. When the informal borders, when we open the official borders, I think that is when we will get the real second wave of COVID-19. Of course, there may be medical experts or epidemiologists on the chat that may want to correct that and I would be willing to listen. But that's my position that we are still in the first wave which we mismanage. And, we, and only when we open the second the borders, we will see what happens with a second wave. God forbid, us, forbid that if the first wave is this bad, how the second wave could potentially unfold. And with those few comments, I will open up, I will stop there and, and, and let the, the, the conversation continue and I will take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution, Dr. Hussein. Uh, next, we'd like to invite Mr. Curtis Williams to um, give his contributions. Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you and uh, good evening to all the members of the panel and everybody else who um, would be part of this discussion. Um, I, like Dr. Hussein, agree that um, the next five years, particularly um, the next two to three years, um, are, going to be particular, are going to be very difficult. Um, it's going to be very difficult for Trent Tobago uh, for the simple reason that um, we, have to, we understand that government spending drives a lot of what happens in this economy. So I think even uh, uh, Dr. Hussain could perhaps uh, speak to this. Uh, when you have a lot of the contraction that you've had in the economy in the last uh, five years, a big part of that has to do, um, certainly on the non-oil side, um, to do with government spending, because government spending drives a lot of the, of the other things that are happening within the economy. And of course, government, ex government spending is a factor of, 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 um, of the amount of revenue that the government can receive. And in the last, uh, since 2014, since the, the decline, certainly the collapse of oil prices and uh, what people do not um, quite um, uh, talk a lot about is the collapse of LNG prices. Um, those two things have significantly hurt government revenue. In addition to which, um, as you know, within the last two to three years, um, maybe the last four years or so, with the contraction um, of the, the, the shortage of natural gas production, um, impacting, first of all, the unit costs of the downstream sector, and then the price at which those, the, the downstream sector is paying for natural gas can, um, compared to a lot of its competition, particularly in the United States, have made those two things have made the downstream sector increasingly uncompetitive. So you are going to have a situation, I suspect, over the next two to three years, where the energy uh, sector, not only do we have lower production, um, but we have a situation where those companies are not doing very well. And therefore, government tax revenue is likely to be significantly hurt um, next year and, and the year after that. Because as you know, you can carry forward um, losses into your future taxes. So that's going to be one significant challenge that the government is going to face. The, the government also has a situation where it is very difficult to tax the informal sector, and, and that is probably not going to happen. We know that the way in which the parliamentary composition is likely to happen, which is 22-19, uh, that the government is not going to have the, um, 
constitutional majority that it requires if it's going to uh, introduce legislation and, and change, in fact, the way in which taxes are collected by establishing the revenue authority. So that is not um, likely to happen. And we're going to have to see how is government going um, to be able to raise revenue. My suspicion is that they are probably going to go back to VAT of 15% rather than 12.5%. Um, I think that they are certainly going to have to borrow significantly. Um, the, the, the fiscal space of borrowing is certainly narrowing, but they are going to borrow, I think, heavily on the domestic side. I don't think they are going to try very hard, or I don't think they are going to get a lot of borrowing happening um, on the far, on, in, in terms of, in terms of um, on the international market. Um, borrowing, of course, on, on the domestic side is going to crowd out some of the uh, private sector. So that's going to be another issue that the finance minister is going to deal with. But in, with revenue falling um, and, uh, from, and, and, and the risk that that poses to the economy, I am sure that uh, Moody's and, and standards and poor's and so on will then relook at, um, at, at, at the way in which it, it makes a judgment of the economy. And that is likely to lead now to, to a downgrade, I suspect, and, and therefore more difficulty and more expense if you are to borrow, um, certainly on the, on, the global, um, on the global market. So the government is going to have a hard time. And how, how is it going to be able to spend the kind of money that it, it probably needs to spend? How is it going to deal with transfers and subsidies? What policy positions is it going to take? So it's going to take, um, I think in, in, in our business guardian, uh, Winston Dukaran says it's, it's, it's going to take a uh, miracle economic, uh, economic, sorry. And, um, and that's what the new finance minister is going to have to do. He's going to have to be able to, if he can reduce spending, um, and he's going to have to find new ways of, um, of getting revenue. And I, I, I don't see in the short term how he's going to get the additional revenue, how he's going to make the difference uh, up without um, significant borrowing on the domestic side. Thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Williams. Uh, next, we'd like to invite Ms. Denise Deming to give her contribution, Ms. Deming. Thank you very much and thank all of you for joining in tonight. I am very impressed that so many people would join in to a heavy conversation tonight. And thank you very much for sandwiching the non-economists in the middle of this presentation. But you know, I am guided in this presentation by a statement that was made by the late President John F. Kennedy. And he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. We have an opportunity right now in Trinidad to make peaceful rev revolution possible in the social sectors of our country. I want to boldly state that we can rise above the economic doom and gloom and all the miracles that are being suggested, but we can do it. We can rise above that economic gloom and doom by focusing on our human development, because at the end of the day, that's what we have. Fossil fuel is on its decline, and there may be other people who feel that there's, you know, there's hope in there, but globally, fossil fuel is on its decline. And when you look at, when I certainly look at some of the major players in fossil fuel, you are seeing them reposition themselves away from strict fossil fuel to other kinds of fuel initiatives, especially those that can be, be reconstituted. There's another opportunity that we have, and that is our leaders must, and I say must, find a way to engage in some kind of reconciliation or some way of signaling harmony and collaboration in order for their tribes to really get together. I am very, very concerned about the explosion of tribal commentary, negative tribal commentary that we are seeing on the internet. And if we don't, if our leaders don't signal and they must signal by their behavior that they are willing to have some kind of reconciliation and work in harmony, then that to me is a bigger danger than anything else that we have. It is only with a kind of intentionality 
that we will begin to tackle the growing inequity amongst our citizens and reduce the widening gap between the rich and the poor. And when I talk about intentionality, we have to get that signal that this is what we intend to achieve. Our previous panelists have indicated that there are limited resources to draw from. So the big question is, how do we redirect resources in the short term? I'm suggesting that we appropriate a percentage of the 27 billion that Dr. Hussain referred to, which are allocated to transfers and subsidies. But I'm saying that we have to appropriate some of that to programs specifically designed towards the prevention of social ills. You see, prevention has been proven to be more, to be less expensive than reacting. And I'll give you an example. There's a 2016 newspaper report in which the then Attorney General and maybe continuing Attorney General, Faris Alwari indicated that the state pays between 20 to $25,000 per month to keep a prisoner on remand yard. That cost could reach as much as $50 million per month for 2,230 prisoners. And then that could escalate into billions of dollars stretching over years. If we can find a way to prevent that spending, it must, it will be cheaper than what we're doing at the moment. That 20 to $25,000 a month to keep a prisoner in remand yard just does not make sense. And we're seeing globally that people, other countries are trying to come up with different solutions to whatever their crime situation is. It would be cheaper to prevent persons from en ending up on remand yard than it is to keep them there. So we need to embark on a program of prevention rather than a strategy of reacting to social ills. We cannot continue to build prisons. I've said in other, other fora that we need to build mines and not concrete structures. There are three areas that I think we need to focus on and we need to focus on them intensely. One is education or re-education. Secondly, mental health. And thirdly, creativity. When we look at education, we know that there are no quick fixes to the education system. But given the lockdown that we all experienced, we can safely assume that the impact of COVID-19 on persons' access to education was significant. And my own experience is that those persons who came from middle and upper middle class homes and in homes where there was a, a tradition of education and certification, they would have done well. My concern is that those who were not in those circumstances are now behind the curve. They have been significantly disadvantaged. When we've had to have programs in which people were scrambling for laptops or any device to give to children in, who were locked down, then we know that we are we're kind of in trouble. So that COVID activity means that there's a demand, there's an increase in the demand for experienced teachers. And that allows us an opportunity for some of those experienced teachers to mentor young people so that they can teach because there will be a cohort of COVID-19, 2019 to 2020, COVID cohort, I am describing them, that really need some kind of hand up in order for them to I don't know if they can ever catch up, but certainly for, to prepare them for continuing education. So to me, education and re-education is a significant area. We also have an opportunity to re-employ to re some of the recently retired teachers who could assist in this area, because we almost have to come up with a parallel system to look at education and re-education. The second point I wish to talk about is mental health. And when I was preparing for this presentation, I reached out to a colleague who is involved in the mental health sector. And she shared with me that they are already seeing increases in mental health issues. 
and commented that this should be an area of focus in the short term. It's a soft area, it's a human development area. Let's couple that statement with a report from the Commissioner of Police that in March 2009, reports of domestic violence numbered two, 2019, not 2009, in March 2019, reports of domestic violence numbered 42. Compare that which with March 2020, there were 96. That is a 100% increase in reports on domestic violence. People are saying that because we have a new bureau within the police service, you're getting more reports. But whatever it is, there is a spike. And that will continue as long as people are under the kinds of pressures that we are under based on COVID-19. And if the predictions that we're now experiencing um, our first phase and that there is a second phase to come, the second wave to come, then we're we in for a hard time. The third area I want to look at is the area of creativity. And we often view our creatives as people who are almost invisible, but they're the people who create those annual calypsos. We have the highest production of, of material by artists on an annual basis. Both the performing and the visual arts have been significantly negatively impacted by COVID. So we have to find an opportunity for them. When I looked at the PNM manifesto, and I'll, I'll do a quotation from that, it says, we will increase financial support through grants and soft loans for the farmers, the agri processors, and the creative and cultural industries. That is an absolutely phenomenal kind of approach. It's, it's lovely to hear that. But that needs to be acted out. And we know that we have an implementation deficit. The idea of the cultural ambassadors is a tremendous idea because if we can attach cultural ambassadors who are the creatives to different communities, we can see a kind of mentoring. And I just want to quickly add that in the past, I have talked about the digitization of of the world and there's a, a quote from the New York Times and it says that that um, cyber security ventures prediction that there will be a 3.5 million unfilled cyber security jobs globally by 2021 this is up from 1 million positions in 2014. We have an internet penetration of 77 percent we need to ask ourselves given those two facts how can we be part of an emerging sector and how can we prepare our young people for us to be the supplier of cyber security labor to the world so just to summarize the areas that i have focused on have been education and re-education men mental health cyber security and the creatives if we are able to really harness the, the, create, the human development and the, hum, the people in that sector, we, we are very, very sure that we will come out of this maybe in another two years or so, maybe three, but we certainly down the road will be better. But what it requires is a kind of leadership that signals to our people collaboration and humanity and empathy. If we don't have that, then some of the nasty posts that I've been seeing on Facebook may become a reality. And with those few remarks, thank you very much. And I now hand back over to Christian. Thank you very much, Ms. Deming, for your contribution. Uh, next, we'd like to invite Mr. Kevin Ramnarai to give his contribution. Mr. Ramnarai. Hi. Are you all hearing me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, good. Well, um, thanks very much. So tonight's presentation, um, look, tonight we're looking at, you know, what does the next five years hold for Trinidad and Tobago? Um, I saw that Anthony Wilson has written something to that effect a few days ago in the Business Express. Um, I would just touch on about five points. Um, the first point, Denise, Denise mentioned um, that, you know, BP two weeks ago, 
less than two weeks ago, a few days ago, took a decision or announced the details around their new net zero carbon strategy. And uh, those, those, that signals a change in the business model of BP and it signals a change in their strategy. And that announcement came against the backdrop of a report of significant losses for BP in the first half of 2020, which no, no doubt are related to COVID-19. And in announcing those far-reaching changes, BP announced that their investment profile would change as follows. Firstly, there's a shift in low carbon, there's a shift towards low carbon investments to reach around $5 billion, 5 billion US dollars per year. By 2030, it is currently a billion. So that's a tenfold increase in low carbon investments over the course of this decade, the 2020s. The second thing which should be of, you know, should, should be of concern to us, um, given BP's presence in Trinidad, is their, they have decided to reduce their current global level of hydrocarbon production by 40% by the year 2030. Uh, of that 40%, the first 25% is to be achieved by the year 2025 and the next 15% by the year 2030. So the company, which is BP, uh, which has a significant, which is probably the significant actor in our economy is going to fundamentally change and become a different company by the year 2030. And I think we need to ask ourselves, how is that going to affect us? Um, and I think Curtis could speak to that um, later on in our program tonight. Um, the other issue which I wanted to talk to is um, some points which I raised today with the Newsday uh, with regard to some of the major challenges that I see the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and you know, um, we know that we probably will have a swearing in of the cabinet by early next week. But some of the major challenges that will will greet the Minister of Finance, whoever that person is, and the Minister of Energy, whoever that person is. Um, firstly, there's a challenge related to the economic impact of COVID-19 on our economy. Um, the economic contraction in 2020, which Mr. Imbert had said would be negative 2.6, is likely to be a lot worse than that, and is likely to be the worst economic contraction since the year 1983. And in 1983, the economy contracted by over 10%. I think it was about 10.3%. So the first issue that the government has to grapple with is the whole issue of cash management. Um, the government, many people may not know this, um, some people may, um, the government has to find, the Minister of Finance on a monthly basis, has to find about $1.5 billion every month to pay wages for, for, for the public service. Um, and that, when I say public service, we're talking about the regional corporations too, and we're talking about the RHAs and so on. So I have estimated that overall, the country needs about $42 billion per annum to operate. And that figure does not include monies that are needed for the PSIP, for building bridges, paving roads, doing capital projects and so on. So we need $42 billion every year to minimally operate the country. It is likely, however, that our revenue for 2020 and 2021 will be around $30 billion for both of those years. Um, we are therefore running deficits, so we will run deficits for 2020 and 2021 in excess of $20 billion for, for each of those years. So the first task of the Minister of Finance come next week is to find money to keep this economy ticking. Um, and some of you all have already pointed out what some of his sources of money could be, but of course the minister can borrow um, and the minister can continue to tap the heritage and stabilization fund. But as the prime minister pointed out during the campaign, that is an unsustainable strategy. 
So the immediate problem is, you know, getting that $42 billion to run the economy. That's the first problem. The other problem is something which has gone largely unmentioned. Probably if you are an ardent reader of the Business Guardian, um, you may pick it up. But there is a there is a, sign a significant issue in this country um, involving three state companies, TNTEC, NGC, and TGU. And that is not a new problem. It's actually a problem which has been around for a while, but it has now reached to what I consider to be crisis proportions. Uh, this is the issue where TNTEC owes NGC significant monies, and I'm told the figure could be somewhere in the region of 4.5 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. And TNTEC also owes TGU a lot of money. Um, and that is not because TNTEC is a badly run company. In fact, I think TNTEC is one of the better run state companies that we have. But it's because TNTEC has not had a rate increase in, I, I think about, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. I think TNTEC has not had a rate increase in 11 years. And in that 11 year period, the cost of running TNTEC have gone up, all right? Uh, so the population is largely unaware of that issue between TNTEC, NGC, and TGU. And if it, if it is not dealt with, it will have serious ramifications for all three companies. TGU, for example, has, this, has one source of revenue, which is TNTEC. They have one customer, TNTEC. I mean, at least NGC has multiple customers, right? Uh, TGU, has, TGU has one customer who, if that customer doesn't pay them, they have obligations to service an international bond and to pay salaries and so on too. So the third issue is the issue of Forex availability and uh, the, the issue of um, ease of doing business. And I, I put them together in one because I think that those two issues are keeping our private sector from getting off the ground and investing in this country again. So I think we, the Minister of Energy, Minister of Finance, and the Prime Minister will have to deal with those issues of Forex availability and ease of doing business. It will also be interesting on the topic of Forex availability. It will be interesting to see whether the government, which is the same government that has been in power for the last five years, will continue with its policy position of staunchly defending the prevailing exchange rate at $6.79. And lastly, the slide of point leases has to be halted and reversed. Um, my information is two more plants may be shutting down in coming weeks. Uh, one of them is the Trinjen one plant for which an, an announcement was made of a shutdown a few weeks ago and that decision was deferred. And the other plant that we are hearing about that may be having to close its doors is the M5000 plant, which is, um, I believe, still the largest methanol plant in the world. So to stop that slide, that, that of course has to be addressed. The price of natural gas sold by NGC to plants at Point Lisa's has to be reduced. Uh, it is my understanding that that issue is being addressed as we speak. Um, I don't think it has been uh, it has been completed. Um, and, and the last point is that the NGC may be facing, and Curtis again could, could add some, some details to this, the NGC may also be facing a significant take or pay liability exposure due to reducing demand from its point leases customers. And just to clarify what that means, the NGC buys gas from upstream suppliers and it sells that gas to its downstream customers. The contractual arrangements between the NGC and its upstream suppliers includes a take or pay clause, meaning that the NGC must take the gas or they must pay for it. So if, they are, if their customers are requiring less gas, it means that the NGC would have to tell its suppliers in the upstream that they, they too will have to take less gas and that creates this take or pay liability for the NGC. So those are some of the, in my opinion, and that doesn't even deal with COVID-19, which is the major issue in the country right now. Those are some of the issues facing the country. Um, there is, it is not all bad news for Trinidad and Tobago. 
there is a, there are a couple of natural gas projects which will come into production and impact our natural gas situation. Uh, and by the year 2022, the Matapal project, the, the, um, the Colibri project, the Barracuda, the Barracuda project, the Cassia Sea Compression project, and so on. Um, so those should, those should bring, those should be helpful to our economic situation, the BHP Ruby project. And of course, our deep water exploration continues and it's so far so good with that. So that is some of the good news, um, but it looks like we are in for at least a difficult 2020, six months left in 2020, and a difficult 2021, 2022 period. So the difficult situation is going to persist for a while. Um, I'll, I'll just, before, before, I, before I leave, I just wanted to share a graph with you all. Um, and it, I just pulled up this graph because Curtis had mentioned natural gas prices. And I hope you all could see the graph because it's important to understand um, these things when you, when you hear them from, right. So I'm gonna share the screen. Is the share screen working? Rebecca? Yes, Mr. Ram Ryan, the share screen is working. Oh, right, it's working now, good. All right, I don't know if you all could, are you all seeing this graph? This is a graph of natural gas prices for different, for different natural gas markers around the world. And it also includes the price of Brent oil, which is the gray line. So the gray line is Brent and the Brent oil prices are on the secondary axis. And on the primary axis, we have natural gas prices. And you can see the impact of COVID. You can see COVID-19, of course, started, um, let's say COVID-19 is somewhere around this region here. You can see this dramatic fall in gas prices in the Brent oil price. But if you look at the yellow line, the yellow line is J the JKM, which is the Japan-Korea marker. That's a natural gas reference price. And the point I want to make is that the, if you look at the yellow line carefully, the collapse in natural gas prices had two, two parts to it. There was a significant collapse in Asian gas prices in the year 2019, long before COVID was known to us. Natural gas prices in Asia were in decline. Then you could see this, this section of the graph here of the yellow line collapsing again, a second collapse. That's a COVID-19 induced collapse. If you look at the green line, the green line is a European marker called the TTF, the transfer title something as a Dutch marker. You can see the same relationship. You see a sudden collapse in 2019 and a second collapse in 2020. Uh, so what's the point? The point is that the point is to just add some flavor to what Curtis was saying. Natural gas prices, which we depend on heavily for the value of our LNG cargos, were in pain before COVID-19. So COVID-19, that's why I keep saying COVID-19 made a bad situation worse. Um, and if you have graphs for ammonia and methanol prices, you would probably see similar relationships where even in the year 2019, prices um, for ammonia, for example, were not so great. So it is so before COVID-19 became an issue and you know destroyed all this demand and so on in the world, the the price environment, the external price environment was not great. So I just wanted to end with that point. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramnarine. Next, we'd like to invite Mr. Mariano Brown to give his contribution. Mr. Brown? Yes, thank you. Um, well, coming up, I, well, I, I don't know what else to add, really. I think everything has been said <laughs> uh, with regard to the difficulties that we face moving forward. The, the real issue is what are we going to do? Um, uh, Kevin puts on the table uh, some critical issues. Um, with respect to specific sectors and in particular the business model that we followed um, 
in real terms since uh, 1993 and uh, as amended by the uh, Atlantic LNG in 1999, uh, which is really which was really responsible for the sort of buoyancy that took off after 99 from 1999 to 2008. And then um, the sort of boom we had in the commodity prices in the period 2011 to 2014, short boom, largely associated with China. The additional complication, of course, since then, is um, what we're seeing is a, a wider, um, I, I would hesitate to call it a trade war. It's really a, a geopolitical um, fight for position between the USA and China, which has now also begun to affect the whole concept of free trade. Free trade is no longer um, as free as we like to think it is, and it is considered, or they always had geopolitical positions in it. Um, but I think it has become even more complicated uh, in, in the short run, certainly under Trump administration, though I doubt that a change in the Trump administration is going to make a heck of a lot of difference to how this plays out in the future, now that the battle lines have been set. Um, so the, 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 the key issue is what do we do? And um, so I, I think that the, the, the problems have been well articulated. I thank Denise Deming for pointing out some of the social issues and so on. Um, unfortunately, I don't think those are going to be addressed because they really require a difference in positioning, a difference in, in terms of, of, of allocations, in terms of um, revenue, uh, which will not be possible given the fairly bleak outlook. And I don't think it is two years. I know the prime minister has attempted to limit the, um, the thinking to just simply a short period of, of damage. Um, this is going to be much more far reaching than that. And why do I say that? Well, very simply, the, the degree of, of change uh, in the world political economy, the degree of loss, the, the decline, we've moved from um, initial, initial estimates by the, the IMF of minus 3% for uh, 2020, with a, so, some sort of rebound taking place in 2021. Um, well, I don't see that happening, but we'll wait to see because we'll have to have updates certainly towards the August, November period. And the IMF did say that they didn't have all of the data required and the initial estimates, more than 70% of them were likely to be wrong. So take that into consideration. And I think what we have to say is that the outlook generally for the performance of the world economy in 2020, 2021 and beyond is likely to be muted. And the Trinidad's issues are structural. I think that's the point that Kevin was, Kevin was trying to play, although he may not have used those words. We have an issue in terms of the, the, struct, the, struct, the way Trinidad and Tobago's economy is structured. And in the circumstances, um, the, the budget number of $30 billion with regard to a requirement of 42, the, the 42 billion number is a number that we would have used in 2008 when we were estimating the revenue requirements of Trinidad and Tobago, we re-estimated them in, 2020, in 2008 as an ongoing basis at 42. Now, we're talking about our revenue position and that's $2,008. So adjusting for inflation, of course, the requirements would be above that. So, and that's not in, taken into consideration the substantial increases in, in, in subsidies and transfers. So the revenue shortfall is in position. Um, that's going to be there. Um, I've heard talk about borrowing requests. And I would just simply like to remind the listeners that both the SNP and Moody's rating indicated that they would um, one, treat Trinidad and Tobago's position as stable for the time being, but that they would relook at their estimation of Trinidad's position depending on how it managed its fiscal position and that a continued shortfall in government, uh, a, a continued deficit on the part of government would change the picture. So I think we could look forward to downgrades. Uh, if, we are, was in, if we were on the borderline um, with respect to standards and poor, I think we can expect both standards and poor and Moody's to basically put us at down status, even if Mr. Imbo does not recognize such a term. But the reality is that our borrowing requirement is going to go up. Um, so what do we do? And I think that's really where we need to start talking about focusing our minds because the revenue position is going to be difficult. Um, I, I, I can't remember who said it, 
but I think it was Curtis uh, talking about increasing revenue, right? And I think he was talking about tax, re tax revenue because government's position. Well, I don't think that's going to be possible in the short run. I don't think that is going to be possible in the short run. In any event, I think the, the economic text tells me that it is far better to manage and to deal with the expenditure side than it is to do with increasing uh, uh, taxation. Because what that does is essentially lead to um, non-compliance. And we already have a high level of non-compliance. So what we have to talk about is how do we get the underlying administrative structures in Trinidad to be able to operate much more efficiently and also to how do we bring um, to follow through from, from Denise Deming's point, how do we bring Trinidad to be able in terms of the adjustment process? Because this is what we are talking about. It's an adjustment process. Um, and I don't think that we can get away from that. Um, yes, you can have uh, recourse to the, the, the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, but that's not gonna last too long. Um, we've been able to, to, to do it successfully so far, but the degree and the magnitude of the decline, uh, there's a great difference between 30 billion and 42, and an even bigger difference between 30 and 50, right? That revenue gap cannot be plugged by the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. It can't, right? So that means that government cannot continue in its subsidization mode. Um, and that speaks directly to the issue of electricity rates, um, which speaks to the underlying competitiveness of the Trinidad and Tobago economy. Right? We've, the argument is that we have a natural advantage by way of having cheap energy and on the basis of that, our um, uh, exports were cheaper. Uh, well, that would have to, that just simply has to go. That's not gonna happen. So if we're talking about um, becoming more competitive, more efficient, um, a couple of things has to happen there. And, and that has to do, uh, we have to go immediately to how we deal with the exchange rate. And the, the, I think that the argument with regard to devaluation is a false one. Um, we have been we have been keeping our, our exchange rate at, at an artificial peg. We're supposed to have a, a floating exchange rate, um, and that um, has to be allowed to float. Simple as that. I don't think we could get around from that. So, how is government going to become more efficient in terms of what it does? And this is this has to move away from just simply talk. The minister talks about savings of ten billion dollars. When in fact, what he really means is he cut expenditure by $10 billion. There's no savings. Savings is something you put in the bank. And we haven't had that. And we aren't going to have it moving forward. And how do you bring the unions into the picture? All right, this, and, and, and also, this continued talk about re, re, restarting um, the refinery. Well, we need to get real on that score too. Right? Because we've sold the country a bag of goods in terms of the continuity of that, of that refinery. Once you close that refinery down, reopening it is a multi-billion dollar exercise. And, and we've seen evidence of that in terms of whether the tanks have been able to take additional pressure, whether they've been able to take um, uh, uh, new, new, um, new stocks, but well, they can't. So that we're operating with an even, much more, with an even more limited um, capacity. And the, the, you can't, the, the requirements for the refinery and for actual just simply keeping uh, what we consider strategic stocks for Trinidad and Tobago alive, in other words, the ability to keep sufficient fuel in position, they require the same assets. So it's either the refinery or keeping Trinidad and Tobago running. And that is a no brainer. You can't open the refinery. So that's not going to take place. So what then does Trinidad and Tobago do in terms of its future, in terms of increasing its level of economic activity? Well, <clears throat> we've, we had some, uh, we've had some contributions before which talked about um, uh, uh, certainly agri the agriculture sector and the efficiency of the agriculture sector. But we also have to talk about efficiency generally. And I also think we, we have to talk about whether we're gonna keep some of the existing businesses in Trinidad and Tobago. Right? As much as we think that they're not going to go anywhere, some have already started to relocate or alternatively shift their production capacity, incremental production capacity elsewhere. Right? The Mobidas group of companies, for example, have as much business in Costa Rica as they have in Trinidad and Tobago. Right? It's not too hard to think that um, <clears throat> associated brands could do something similar if they don't have it in the pipeline already, all of which is going to make our position um, much more difficult. So the issue is, how do we get the country to understand, or how do we get our citizenry to understand um, that we're going to have to do more with less, and we're going to have to become more productive. 
how do we get the unions to buy into that concept? Because for the last 20 years, uh, we've been accustomed to ongoing salary increases. We're going to have to have real adjustments. So I don't see any alternative to allowing the exchange rate to float, whether you like it or not, that's where we are. And um, that's something that's going to continue. And we have to adjust at the level of how our utilities operate. How do we make WASA more efficient? How do we make TN Tech more efficient? How do we get rid of that pricing issue? And that pricing issue cannot be solved. We cannot, we can no longer afford to have, uh, uh, if you want, a, a hidden subsidy for electricity. And that is going to translate all along the production curve, all along the production curve, not only with regard to households, which is really where the conversation has been, how it's going to affect the consumer, but the more important issue is how it's going to affect business operations, because that was one of the advantages of operating in Trinidad and Tobago, the, the, the cheap cost of electricity. So that raises the issue now of, of, of renewables and the adjustments in terms of how we, the, the grid is shaped and so on and so forth. So it, these are not easy times and the level of thinking um, that has gone into it, the, the, mani the manifesto, the PNM's manifesto literally um, uh, has nothing inventive in it. it. It doesn't really have any real address to the future. It, it tells us to look at the Vision 2030 document um, which is a sort of upgrade of Vision 2020. But the underpinnings of those documents were that we had the money to spend. We don't. So that we have to go back to first pass, first principles in terms of how do you get GDP to grow and what are the key changes that have to be made in addition to the ease of doing business. And the ease of doing business is just simply one attribute. Having made those changes and ease, say, say it, gets, it, it gets easier to do business. People have to have some confidence in the system. So it is the confidence building measures and the changes to making our overall systems um, much more flexible and much more efficient. That is going to be, I think, the critical issue for the next five years. Uh, and um, I have to say that the, the start so far has not been auspicious in that regard. The conversations, unfortunately, are totally rooted in the past and have not begun to embrace what the difficulties that our future holds. And our public is not prepared for it, they're not. They have heard a couple of things, but I don't think they understand how far reaching these changes are going to be. Uh, and on that note, I would like to end. Thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Brown. So now we would like to open the um, floor to our audience to pose questions. Um, so to begin, we have a question. Let's we'll start with a question uh, from Mr. Ian Narayan Singh. Mr. Narayan Singh, you may unmute your mic and put forward your question. Yes, um, good night, everybody. So um, I'm not an economist. I'm just a, a small business owner who's very concerned, like everyone else, with the state of the economy and the future. Um, during the conversation, it was mentioned that, that you know, there's a huge PT dollar bill, basically, to run the economy, pay salaries, etc. So you see it's pretty inevitable that the dollar is going to be devalued. Um, however, I know, I think um, Kevin mentioned that um, the government's stance is that they want to keep it as it is. So my question is, what is their motivation for keeping it as it is? Because I mean, I know it's gonna have a detrimental effect on the standard of living of us, um, the citizens, um, but does, is the government's motivation more than just altruistic? That's my question. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Narayan Singh. Um, let's see, Dr. Hussein, would you like to address this question? Thanks, Christian. The You're first welcome. part of the question came across a little, um, it, it broke up for me. Can you repeat it for me, please? Yes, yeah, sure, um, Roger. Um, it's, it's basically to summarize, um, what would keep the dollar from being devalued? Kevin, men Kevin mentioned that the government stance is that they want to keep it as it is, but I'm just interested in what is the motivation by the government to keep it as it is? Okay, good. So 
The current exchange rate is about 6.79 TT to one US dollar. And the government is of the view that if they increase the value of the, or if they change the exchange rate to say 8 TT to one US dollars, that there would be a lot of imported inflation. And because a lot of the goods and goods that we import, that, that we use in Trinidad and Tobago, comes through the conduit of imports, that it would adversely affect the Trinidad and Tobago economy. Now, the state of the Trinidad and Tobago economy at this point in time is our non-energy exports, however, is very adversely affected. And it is very adversely affected in part because the real effective exchange rate has appreciated. And what does that mean? Well, for the time period 2000 to 2014 in particular, there was a strong level of aggregate demand in the Trinidad and Tobago economy. And basically, government expenditure was buoyant. Basically, consumer expenditure was buoyant. Firms were spending a lot of money. And so the high level of aggregate demand led to a rapid increase in the price level. A rapid increase in the price level vis-a-vis -vis our main trading partners. The consequence of which is goods and services produced in Trinidad and Tobago became relatively more expensive than goods and services produced say, in the USA. And therefore it became easier for Trinidad and Tobago shoppers to go to Miami and buy goods and services and come back home. If it is you depreciate the Trinidad and Tobago currency that becomes more expensive and therefore it's more difficult to engage in transactions. Some degree of devaluation or as Mariano tried to say it politically correct, some degree of uh, competitiveness in the exchange rate is required. But I also threw out on the table a parallel intervention and both these things should be considered. And I think it is the PNM manifesto that mentioned using seasonal labor in the agricultural sector. The truth is we have an economic boom taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, in the, it, it, it's an economic boom in, coast, in, in quotes because there is some probability and the CMO did mention that some of our COVID-19 cases came via immigrant workers, illegal immigrant workers. But even so, we have a boom taking place in the informal immigrant labor population in Trinidad and Tobago. And if we could find a formula to make the, uh, this aspect of the labor force work, say, under a two-year contract in agriculture, in niche market, uh, uh, export agriculture or agriculture that goes towards import substitution and the same for manufacturing, then we would reduce our needs to import certain goods and services. And at the same time, we may be able to increase our exports of some goods and services, all working towards a favorable improvement in the balance and payment, a reduction on pre of pressure on the foreign exchange market whilst we fix other aspects of the economy. And I think that this, we already, in my judgment, made a mess of the natural gas boom. And so we now have a different type of boom that if we manage it wisely, providing this whole COVID situation is brought under control in, in, in some way in the next few months, if we manage it wisely, we could combine the labor market chan uh, boom together with the a more competitive exchange rate. It may not have to go to nine to one now, for example, it could go to 750. And that combination can help solve in a softer way the landing of the change required in the foreign exchange market. So I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but those are the elements that I would use as a response towards answering the problems with regards to the foreign exchange market. Could I, could I make the point, and I, I, I've heard you on this before, and we've had this discussion before already. I, I, you know, I, I would hesitate to use the word labor, um, boom. What you're really talking about is you have additional available labor, which technically should bring down the price of labor if it is made available to the right sectors. Now, the issue with regard to agriculture has many difficulties in it, in particular, the issue of land tenure and land availability. And I think those are specific. So I, I, I can't use the term boom at all. I accept that there is more labor available and could be used for that sector. But that also has to talk about the sort of productive capacity and whether people are, are, are prepared to engage at that level. I know that you are suggesting that, they, that there should be a way of doing it officially because that's what will make a difference. And so far, 
nobody has been prepared to bite that bullet. So I'm Thank saying you. that there's, there's a possibility, but there's no boom. There's more labor. Okay, so let me let me let me um, if 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 the chair would allow me, let me respond to that because I don't think that is correct, Mariano, for the following reasons: a significant proportion of these Venezuelans are employed in Trinidad and Tobago. Where are they employed? They are employed in places and spaces that either had spare capacity, and if you have spare capacity and you improve on employment, you lower the per unit cost of, 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 of output by virtue of using the production function more efficiently. So for example, if a bar could have run with, with one bar and, and, and seven workers, and you had the bar running with one bar, uh, um, with, with the bar running with two workers, and you now move to seven workers, of course you bring them per unit cost by a more effective combination of the capital and the labor ratios to run the bar. So that's one. Two, bars and places like bars that provide services of various forms have expanded in Trinidad and Tobago in response to the cheap and easy availability of labor. We have even seen it, the change in the production function from a homeowner's perspective. Some homeowners went ahead and Transform their homes and extended the capital stock in their homes so that they could rent to Venezuela. And so, in, 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 a, in a quasi informal, soft way, the capital formation process then did response. What, what I'm saying is that the response needs to be better determined. And we want the response to be on an export oriented or import substituted uh, oriented side. What we had is the same mistakes the government made from 2000 to 2015 or 2016 occurring with the Venezuelan labors. Leave the incentive structures is, the workers went where, where they, they got the best return, the free market responded to the, responded to the absorption of labor by through their capital formation process, and our, ex, our balance of payments worsened. That's terrible management. And you say these things all the time, and it basically falls on, on, on deaf ears, but that's the way I see it, Mariano. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I have objected to your use of the term boom. That you sound just like in birth. <laughs> I would respond later. Let somebody else speak. I um I don't know if I could just jump in very quickly here. Yes, um, please do, Mr. Williams. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I've heard Dr. Hussein um, talk about the sole issue of agriculture. And to me, um, the notion about that we are going to somehow, as a country, suddenly become a real significant producer of agriculture, if even enough to, um, to, to, to feed ourselves, I think is not going to happen. And it doesn't make sense. For example, why would we as a small country want to say that we can, for example, grow rice when we could simply buy it from Ghana. And I say simply buy it from Ghana simply because of the scale that would be required. So we are fooling ourselves, I think, if we somehow feel that we can be competitive and say something like rice. I think what might be a better option is if you have, for argument's sake, two or three Sanders resorts in Tobago or some other kind of major tourism um, product in Trinidad. And you then say we have 400,000 visitors per annum. They need to eat. They need things that they, they may need, um, pineapples. They may need specific kinds of products. And those are the products that then we can link the agriculture sector to the tourism sector. And then we can also, re we can then link that tourism sector to that arts and culture sector. And I think those that that kind of approach is a more sustainable approach than this notion that we are going to or, or that or that what we may have is that we have a whole lot of people um growing the same things you have the, the you have prices um collapsing on them and then seasonally prices going up and we have the same kind of situation we have now of course i know people quickly argue about about putting in place an, a situation where you can manufacture and so on but ask many of the manufacturers the challenge that they have in getting um, guavas, in getting different fruit, because there's just not the kind of scale. And people growing 
um, food on one and a half acre, two acres of land is not going to give us the scale and the unit cost that we require to be competitive. So I think the $500 million the government says is going to spend in additional agriculture and so on, into improving our agriculture access rule and so on, those things have to be done. But I want to hear a strategy that makes sense, not just that we are going to somehow try to feed ourselves, but that that strategy is going to ensure that when we, when we invest in agriculture, that we have the kind of returns, because we are not even talking about the, the, the packaging and the manufacturing and so on, that will be required where the money is. But you notice that I, I keep on thinking that we are living in La La Land when we think that somehow we spend a lot of money on agriculture and I suspect we are going to be not significantly improved in five years' time. Uh, let me respond to that a little. Christian, uh, so Curtis, the, if it is you have a boom in unskilled labor in your economy, so you have several factors of production. One is capital, one is skilled labor, and one is unskilled labor. So if you look at the literature, you would see that immigrant labor because of the language barrier, regardless of how skilled they are, generally falls into the category of unskilled labor. So this is where a holistic policy environment comes in. And the literature says that if you have a boom in a factor of production, then the nation should produce and export uh, those commodities abundant in that factor of production. So, what, so there are a number of avenues. It could be in lower end manufacturing, but it can be standalone. Yes, you put some of them in agriculture, but what I am saying is you don't leave it entirely up to the free market as we have done. We have left it up to the free market and where have these unskilled and particularly unskilled beautiful women gone? They have gone to dance on, 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 on counters and serve in bars. Sometimes when I go to play football in reform and I'm coming back down the road, there are about six bars that I see and outside these bars, you see these uh, women in, in shorts outside the bar, almost beckoning people to come into the bar, and it's crazy. And my point is, we have a boom in a factor of production. What is the use can we make of this boom? Are we going to just allow the free market to use this boom, and in so doing, uh, upset the import sides of things, and by letting them go to bars and whatnot, I am making a direct connection to our current account balance worsening. I'm saying if we are strategic, and even you yourself mentioned it, Curtis, that if we link, say, agriculture or, lower, or, 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 or labor intensive manufacturing with, say, a plant to probably open our sandals or some other entity, the backward and forward linkages, just like we always talk about going into ethanol and plastic because we have a lot of natural gas, the backward and forward linkages associated with abundance of labor going into agriculture or manufacturing is what would bail out this economy. Just the opposite is happening. No structured planning, no systematic uh, thinking of how to link the factor markets with the commodity markets. And then we complain about the foreign exchange situation. We have a foreign exchange situation because we are not using the factor endowment new or dynamic appropriately. I mean, I, I think that's the but, best but, way I can say it, but I hope some and, of And you're right, but here's the problem. The problem is a political one. And the problem has been political from day one. We don't want to accept how many Venezuelans we really do have here. That's the first <laughs> point. And, and the second point, because we have not embracing them, if we're not embracing them and we have them under the table, they will go into all sorts of dysfunctional usages. The people whom I have met, um, and I have Venezuelan links, so let's, let me be clear about that. None of my family is here who have come, however. Um, there are engineers here, petroleum engineers, all different kinds of engineers. There are IT people, there are doctors, there are nurses, right? There are many people in several different walks of life, right? But the issue of recognition and certification have driven them into all sorts of what we would consider to be stopgap measures. And that's what they're here for. They're here for stopgap. The point is, and I agree with you on this one, that we have to structure a way to bring them in. What is the problem? The problem is that they are, like every person, when we increase the factor of labor in this situation, uh, when the unemployment rate is going to rise, is that they're going to be viewed as interfering with the domestic process. Why not did this? So I think if she was able, she'd want to talk to us. So that, that, that's how I would respond to you. 
I will let someone else respond yes. before I'm coming. So thanks, Mayan. Thank you very much for your contributions, Dr. Hussein, Mr. Williams, and Mr. Brown. Uh, next, we want to um, invite Mr. Saret um, to give a question, at, followed by Mr. Duff. Fire department found her in a burning building. She's got burns all over her body. Hi, good evening, oh, everyone. Mr. Saret, yeah. Hi, good evening, good evening. I'm first for the opportunity to um, ask this question. Well, it is actually um, three parts, three quick questions. One for Mr. Williams, you mentioned earlier in terms of the different categories of revenue. So almost in, in preparation for the, for the lecture, you know, I went on Central Bank website just trying to understand some of the statistics. So I just wanted to find out what actually constitutes non-tax revenue, that, that line that says non-tax revenue in, in 2015, 2016, it was about $9.6 billion and it seemed pretty significant for all things considered. Um, to, so Ram Narayan, um, that's a very interesting point you mentioned in regards to um, increases in rates of utilities. So I guess from an economic and political standpoint, um, knowing that the government has to both reduce, further reduce subsidies, aka raise gas prices, and increase the rates of utilities, how soon you think these measures should be um, implemented and considered? And just a general question for the panel, the gentleman earlier also said that, you know, he's not an economist. I am definitely not an economist, but I just wanted to find out uh, what you all think are the top five or so economic indicators, the average citizen like myself should try to understand so that they could get a true appreciation of the state of the economy, you know, just so that they could be able to follow, just so that they're able to contribute to the discussion. You know, how, how can we make economics a bit simpler and easier to understand? And even the access to information, because I don't know if anyone has tried to go on CSO website, I hope there's no one here listening who would CXO, but uh, it could be a bit tedious. At Central Bank is a little bit easier, but generally, if, you, if you're searching for that info, just to get an appreciation and get a better understanding, it's sometimes difficult. So those are my questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Serrett. Um, next, we have Mr. We'd like to invite Mr. Duff to put forward his questions to the panel, and then we'll have the panel address the questions. Mr. Duff. Hi, good night, everyone. Um, this question uh, is for uh, Dennis Deming. Um, so you mentioned about uh, focusing on education and re-education of the educational system and promoting creativity. But uh, recent research shows that um, most SMEs, multi-medium enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago discontinue their businesses because are not being profitable. And I feel that is because there is a, a significant gap in the education system where, you know, one will know the basic of strategic planning. And so, and then to, to add to that, the ease of doing business into Antibago tends to be difficult for entrepreneurs to you know, plan strategically to be able to survive in, in this current environment we are at right now. And to add to that too, you know, we don't have much research and development support for any small to medium enterprises in Toronto Bago. So my, my question to you is what, how do you move from a traditional educational system to, to a system where we'll be, we'll be able to adapt to the current environment? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, my understanding of the question is that you're asking, how do we move from a traditional educational system to one that will facilitate um, creativity and entrepreneurship and so on? Right. There are some concepts that we, we need to, to try to separate. Um, the first concept is that you talked about the failure of SMEs. And I'm not sure that you can link the failure of some SMEs all the way back to the educational system. The, when I'm talking about the educational system, I'm asking myself the question, to what extent are we preparing our, our young people, those persons, particularly in the secondary schools, for a future that exists that they can fit into? And I think that there's a, there's a gap there that historically we attempted to satisfy that gap when we had 
mechanic shops and electrical shops and woodworking shops and agricultural enterprises in the secondary schools. And we tried to make the, those into examinable courses. We attempted to do that. But if you check with a number of secondary schools at the moment, those things are under-resourced. And when you make a linkage between the under-resourcing of those practical skills with what happens in the marketplace, what you see is, for instance, if someone has to go to a mechanic, they feel that they ought not to pay the mechanic what he's worth. But that is also linked to the fact that in order for you to open a mechanic shop, there's no certification or accreditation that you need to go through. And if there is, if I'm wrong, and there is in fact certification and accreditation, it is not popularly known, nor is it policed. So I'm saying that our country has fallen down on systems, processes, and procedures. So we don't know what the systems are. When you ask the question about the failure of the SMEs, you have to go right back to the ease of doing business. And the ease of doing business, the issues around that have to do with how many pieces of paper do I have to fill out in order to register a company or deregister the company? How do many pieces of paper do I have to fill out to go and revalidate my registration? So the ease of doing business in this country is extremely difficult. And that is your biggest issue with the failure of a number of SMEs. The other thing that I would not want to do is simply to, to link SMEs with innovation because they're two different kinds of things. And one of the issues that Trinidad suffers from is that we do not have and a strong R&D culture so that we don't, for instance, we don't have an innovation tank, an innovation body, an innovation um, community that says, okay, given our society, here is a kind of innovation that suits us very well. I'll give you an example. It is in another country that the steel, ban is, the steel pan is being manufactured. Why is it not, not manufactured here? That to me has to do with, are we going to understand what is required for us to be the steel band manufacturers? If we are the home of Pan, why aren't we like where the Stratovarius violin is created? Why aren't we the cutting edge place for people if they need a steel pan, that's where they go. You see, all of this links back to a total disregard for data. We do not have places where you can go and get the data that says, all right, X number of steel band manufacturers were opened and X number of them survived. So the question you are asked, you are asking a question that pulls a number of different things together that we need to sometimes separate and ensure that we start to focus on them and give them the kind of attention that they require. It is unfortunate in this country that we do not have people dedicated to asking ourselves, what is the innovation that exists in this country? And how could we use that innovation to propel us onto a world stage? And I just want to add a final thing that my observation is that there are Trinidadians on the world stage wherever you go and they are performing and outperforming. Why is it they're not doing it home? And if we answer that question, that may help us with the whole issue of how do we generate foreign exchange from a different stream? I know that I'm not in very um, supportive company here. This is the guys here thinking straight that, you know, the exchange rate, the fossil fuel, the, that kind of thing. And I am saying that our human potential is where we need to look. And if we look at a place like Singapore, Singapore has no, no resources, but look how successful they are. They leverage their human potential. And I think that we have human potential that we can leverage. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Deming. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Williams to um, contribute answers to some of the questions that were raised, Mr. Williams. Yeah, I think there are questions about non-tax revenue and, and, and how do you compute that? Well, um, simply it is, 
as it says, revenue that government doesn't collect um, from taxes. So those could be dividends on state enterprises. Um, it could also be uh, fees and fines, for example, if somebody goes to court um, and they are fined a certain amount of uh, money, then that could um, that is also non-tax revenue. It could be fees that you pay um, for a bar license, for example. Those are non-tax um, revenue. Um, if, for example, government sells a particular asset, that as well um, could be non-tax revenue. So it's essentially revenue that Which is, is collected. That, yeah. that is not taxes. Also, I'm um, Curtis, um, royalty. Royalty is not yes. considered to be tax yes. revenue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I hope I hope that answered uh, your question. Yes, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Hussein, do you have um, anything to add there? I find I, I found that the, the, the gentleman, Mr. Sirret, asked a very good question. Um, about and this is the second time he asked it, and the first time, unfortunately, we didn't adjust it. Um, he asked, How can we teach, bring, demonstrate more economic study population? And what I would say, uh, Mr. Serret, is that the only thing the university could do at this point in time, apart from asking you to come and, of course, do a degree in economics or something close to that is we host public forums like the, as we are doing tonight and make these topics as user-friendly to the population as possible. Um, you also mentioned non-tax revenues. What I would suggest to you is that the Central Bank of Chan Tobago has an online database um, that you should look at it. You could get a wealth of information there. There is also called something called the Handbook of Key Financial and Economic Statistics. You can get a wealth of information there and data-wise. And between those two, you, you, you would get a rich body of material that can help you understand the trends in some key basic economic statistics. Deeper, the deeper you want to go, of course, would be linked to the amount of formal training you should have. So that's what I would recommend you do. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussein. Um, okay, next we have a comment from uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anthony Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, um, I invite you to um, comment and ask a question directly to the panel. Mr. Gonzalez. Okay, looks like um, Mr. Gonzalez is not available. Next, um, I'd like to invite- Can uh, I suggest something to you, please? Can you ask the question on his behalf? Okay, sure. Okay, so his comment is that, it is clear that over the next two or three years, we are facing a massive economic downturn that would require both stabilization and adjustment. The revenue is not there to sustain the level of expenditure in previous years, and we do not have the capacity to borrow to do so. We therefore, we have therefore to bring the country to accept a much lower level of expenditure and pay more for public services. The first requirement, sorry, the first requirement to ensure such an adjustment is a new social compact involving labor, the private sector, government and civil society. But the country is at one of, the, of its worst moments of polarization. I am therefore pessimistic and would like to know what are the essential elements for such a new social consensus and how feasible it is. Yes, hello, yes, um, Mr. Chairman, yes. My, my, my mic was um, muted. Um, ah, are you hearing yes. me now? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, well, I won't, I, won't, I won't spend too much time because I think you have read out the, the question. Um, I'm really concerned that we are calling on the population to pay more taxes, to, to accept uh, lower wages or freeze wages, to pay more for utilities, um, a whole series of, of new burdens that they would have to accept in this, in this period. And I'm wondering how are we going to get them to accept that 
uh, given the kind of situation we, we, we are currently experiencing. You know, this election has not been helpful to this process. And um, we require all hands to come on board and basically to accept that there's a lot of sacrifice that everybody has to make. Um, I don't know this government has a good track record in terms of building a social mm -hmm. compact. Of course, the Minister of Finance likes to say, well, they, they haven't revolted, they have, they have marched, yeah. and therefore, <laughs> therefore they have a social compact. I don't know, you know how that is going to, going to stand up, especially when you have a lot of outstanding wages for people, their, their, their wage settlements going back eight years, nine years, and so forth. So I'm, I'm really curious as to really how we're going to get that social compact. And to me, that is essential um, over the next two years to make that adjustment uh, to go forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, would any of our panelists like to tackle that question? Is yeah, I, I would. I was. Um, I would say that the, the question is absolutely right as as an issue moving forward, and I am not one of those proponents who talk about more taxes, um, for the very simple reason and the economic literature thing that seems to suggest um, that in these circumstances, taxing. Um, increasing taxation has the, the wrong effect um, given the, the situation we face, and it's much better, for example, to let people operate on the basis of the expenditure side. Um, so I'll start off with that. And the second part, um, quite frankly, the political situation and how we've run this particular campaign has been about the politics of division. Um, I often use tactics. We've been, we've been making enemies where um, they haven't been, and if they haven't been, we've, we're finding some. Um, so it's going to be difficult in those circumstances to, to build consensus. But the point is, that is precisely what is going to be required. And that's the difference, the large difference between uh, Trinidad and Barbados uh, in, in a sense of social stability. They fully accept that to maintain an exchange rate, that there will be adjustments on the employment side and expenditure costs. They fully accept that. And there is no... Um, there, there, there's no social dislocation. Well, not that there isn't social dislocation. There's no social upheaval as a result of it. In fact, the last time that they had to face the concept of a devaluation, which was in 1990-1993, um, um, private sector and the labor movement got together and literally walked in the streets to make the whole government to maintain the exchange rate and that they were prepared to make the cuts. Now, that's um, that requires a certain sense of responsibility, which so far has not been displayed by the labor movement. And this is where government, even if it doesn't have the necessary credibility um, to do so, now has to engage in a, in a political discussion with the labor movement to address this. Um, it's difficult. Uh, we've tried it in the past and it hasn't worked because there's no commitment to it. Now, this is where leadership is required. And I know that our track record doesn't, what is not such as to give you optimism, which is what I hear in the question that you're not optimistic about its occurrence. But it is vital if we are maintain, meant to maintain any level of social stability, that that is precisely what has to happen, that they have to engage, that they have to meet, and they have to set a social compact and a, some performance variables which they must commit to, which is not what has happened in the past, which is not what they wanted to do. But that is what the situation requirement. To do what we have been doing will only give us the results that we've had in the past. So that's the, that's the take I will take on it now. This requires political maturity. And if we have to take this week as a guide, um, sadly, both political parties are lacking in that regard. So it's not a very good guess. It's not a very good estimate moving forward for the future but it is precisely what over this weekend they will have to face and discuss internally, certainly internally within the political, the PNM. They have to come to some of those conclusions and find a way to get it done. Yes, um, Mr. Chairman, just, just to add that um, we don't have a very good track record here. Uh, on the last occasion, I think what happened was that the labor movement more or less accepted uh, job stability and they didn't become as aggressive as they started out. But on the other hand, we had civil society groups. We had the 1990 coup. We had a whole lot of instability that caused the kind of disturbance to, uh, uh, that, that, that we saw. On this occasion, my fear is that um, because of the 
close political rates where you may end up with a parliament of 2219 or, or, or let's say 2120. Um, that is going to lead to a kind of competition in politics, which is not going to be very helpful for, 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 so, for social consensus. That is to say, opposition is going to feel that the government can fall, they could easily you know, get, get one or two people to come over, or they could get it, force the government out with no confidence and so on, and they're going to mobilize sectors of the society that are against the government who may be suffering and, and so forth. So I'm seeing a very difficult period ahead in terms of getting that consensus. And as you quite rightly said, Maria, no, we don't have a good track record in terms of doing that. So I think this is something we all have to work on. It requires a tremendous amount of work. Thank you. Thank and you very much, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, it also requires some changes in the personnel lineup. There's nobody in this cabinet or in the last cabinet that fits that bill, Jennifer Patis Bimas included. So they have to have somebody with the necessary, um, how shall we call it, gravitas. They have to bring somebody in. If they don't do it, well, we have a problem. Ms. Deming? Um, Mariano, I, I support what you say, but here's where we, we differ a little. And that is that I think that there is an opportunity here that an astute politician will understand that, that the country is moving in a very negative direction. And I, I do think that Dr. Rowley can be astute if he is sufficiently motivated. And this is where I feel that civil society and citizens have to start to really advocate about what is needed. So for example, collaboration is needed to get certain things through parliament. Civil society and the citizens will have to send that message and we'll have to send that message clearly and in a very strong way. Secondly, empathy is needed. I'm not sure on both sides, and you're quite right, I'm not sure on both sides where they have that capacity for empathy. And you talk about a third person coming in like an emissary to, to, to work with the two sides. And there's a book I read recently, which I think is a fabulous book. It's, it's called Collaborating with the Enemy by Kahin. And he talks about people who have opposing views and there's always a middle ground. So the bottom line is that I think that we, Trinidad and Tobago is at that stage where we recognize that this is a point, this is a significant point in our history. And you know, if I can quote the, the John F. Kennedy statement that those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. So we have an opportunity to make peaceful revolution in this country. And I hope that we all grasp it because in, in different ways, we all have an entry point to be able to try to, 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 to put some leverage. So that's what I wanted to, to comment that I am not seeing this thing as it's not going to happen. I think it is possible for it to happen. Okay, I don't think it's not possible yes. to happen. I'm saying that for it to happen, and you talk about an astute political leader. Well, I have to say, if you want, there's one thing that doc, you can say about Dr. Rowley. He's a good platform leader. As regard to astuteness, um, I, I, I have to say that uh, we will differ strongly on that particular point. And what this requires in these circumstances is that you have to, and I'm not talking about third party to collaborate between the two parties. I don't see that being possible, actually. Um, what you require is a person within, of, of, of with, with who has some degree of national credibility to be brought into the government to deal with this particular situation. Because there's nobody now there who has it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, Jewel Carter Guy has, would like to address the panel at this time. Yes, thank you, Mr. Seely. Good night, everyone. Um, my question falls squarely within discussion that's happening right now. We've talked a lot about the issues and I've been listening to a couple of these um, public discussions now, but I would like the panel to focus for a minute on some concrete solutions. Um, Ms. Deming, you made a very good point, and I agree with you that the civil society and citizens need to 
um, weigh in and, and put some pressure on, on our elected officials. But how exactly do we go about doing that? What is the best route to take? Because I think there are people who have a desire to do that, but they're not sure exactly where to go to start doing it. And another topic I would want some more concrete solutions on. We've all talked about the problem with ease of doing business and the far-reaching consequences of that. But what specifically do we need to do to fix it? Because we all know the problems, but what we really need is to hone in on those concrete solutions that we can then advocate for change, whether it be legislation or all these enabling factors to get that change um, in effect. So we need to highlight some key things that need to be done and highlight how we go about putting pressure on the official, whoever is in power, to make that change happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Carter Guy. We'll just take questions from two more members of our audience, uh, Mr. Ronald, Ronaldo Rollox, first followed by Antonia Ferrier. Mr. Rollox. Good, good night, good night, and good night, everyone. Um, Ms. Deming, um, you must be a prophet you know, of, of some measure. Your comments on, on the education is quite correct. Um, as an educator myself, we have so many issues with getting across the VAPA and TechVoc areas in schools and being sufficiently resourced and getting people accredited. We have too many barriers and hurdles in that respect. Um, too many egos. Um, actually, I, I'm actually also a, a steel pan manufacturing trainer as well. And that also is a, is, a, is a circus in trying to get that properly put through the education system, apart from all the meetings and the lip service we've had. Apart from that, however, Mr. Brong, um, I'd want you and maybe Dr. Hussein as well. Um, do you see linkages between the attitude of workers, which you know we'd want to improve on, and the contradictions that happen in governance? Do you expect workers to accept the economic realities when they see cost and money's disappearing and no accountability or, or no 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 explanations. We hear, okay, there was a there was a $250 million project, somebody's before the court and the money gone. How does one accept the economic realities with large disparities in remuneration and poor governance issues? Thank you very much, Mr. Rollox. So we, next we have Ms. Antonio uh, Ferrier and followed by Mr. Brendan James. At that point, once we have all our questions in, we will ask our panelists to answer the uh, questions put forward by our audience members in their closing comments. So next we have Ms. Ferrier. Ms. Ferrier. Good, after, good evening. I'm curious as to what, if anything, is being done by the universities or any of the government agencies to what I call release the data in Trinidad. The problem, as I see it with SMEs, is not that we don't have ideas or that we are not innovative. It's we can't get funding. There are lots of creative ideas and lots of interests and startups that fail simply because they can't get the funding. And the funding is a function of be able to make a compelling case that this idea has a market to grow in and you cannot get market data in Trinidad. Um, I, the best you can do is go to central bank because CSO is in a mess. You pull manufacturing, you get food and beverages. But if I want to bring out a line of water, I, there is absolutely no comparative data. I can go to the US and pull market data on a site, it's, it's, they, they make it available one year, two years after the fact, but you can, you can see something that tells you this is the size of the market, these are the trends, and when are we going to see, or is anybody at all working on making this sorts of data available for the country? Thank you very much, Ms. Ferrier. Next, we have uh, Brendan James. Mr. James? Hi, good night, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to ask a question. Now, one of the things that I am very uh, concerned about, and it was highlighted by most of the speakers, is our energy situation that we're in right now. Um, working in energy, I found it extremely difficult to talk a little, talk to executives about project financing, 
and why on a levelized cost basis, renewable energy is as attractive or even more attractive than natural gas power generation. And you know, this is an opportunity that we we kind of leaving out to actually save on a lot of natural gas. How do you think we should have, how do you think we should communicate that uh, to the decision makers and to the man in the street in a way that we not having people just think about upfront costs? Because locally people have been talking about things, saying things like solar is too expensive. Um, and, and that may not necessarily be true looking at global prices. So how do we think we can reach this conversation at those different levels and strata in society? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. James. So next we'll just invite our panelists to answer the questions um, put forward by the audience in their closing comments. And we'll begin with Mr. Mariano Brown. Mr. Brown? All right, well, I'll, I'll deal with two things, the ease of doing business and governance, all right? And the, the question was, well, how would the, the, the working class employees feel with regard to hearing the issues of, 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 of how shall we call it, arguments that people have put, dip, dip their hand in the till? Yes, that's a, re that's a real issue, and particularly since we've made it a political football. And the answer to that is that if we have to deal, if we have to deal with things, then we must deal with them on an expeditious uh, basis. So one thing on the political platform is talk about the amount of waste, corruption, and theft. And we talked about a, a, a case being heard. Now that case is a contractual dispute. We are yards away from determining whether any money was stolen. But the, what it was portrayed on a political platform was that it was about, it was about thiefing, right? So that will always inflame issues. And the only way that you're gonna be able to deal with that is to deal with it properly. And dealing with property is you have to empower our institutions to do what they're supposed to do. And it has to be done within a reasonable time frame, and not on the political platform because the political platform raises a number of issues where fellas on the block figure, well, why should I make this effort if somebody else is going to get the benefit? And that's how people perceive politics, right? So I fully accept that there's a contradiction and that, has, that gap has to be closed. Why hasn't it been closed by either political party? Well, um, I won't say that on this particular on this particular um, forum. Ease of doing business. <laughs> and you want specific examples with regard to ease of doing business. Well, I don't know what specific examples you need. You need an ease of doing business in almost everything. So they say, for example, you want to talk about, for example, about applying for a passport, right? Well, in 2009, you could have gotten a passport in a day. At the beginning of this year, you had to wait three months to get an interview, right? If you want an example of ease of doing business and you want specifics, that's one. And by the way, if that's the case, what is the position with regard to applications for building permits? Um, you know that one of the biggest reasons why government doesn't have final approval and the mortgages or being able to get mortgages on some of the HDC houses, because they don't have approval on government projects. Now you could imagine that, that government projects and government houses, which are being done by the HDC, doesn't have all the, list, all, all the approvals. Now, how is that possible if government is, is, is actually dealing with some of its own institutions. How is that possible? So if you're talking about examples of, of, what, of, of, of ease of doing business, a simple matter of building permits, um, approvals that come from the various in, institutions. And we have an example of a one-stop shop, you know. The example of a one-stop shop is TT BizLink, which was initiated in, in 2009-2010, right? Um, and it's carried, uh, carried forward by um, Vasan Bharat. All right. we, we borrowed 30 million US dollars from the IDB in 2016. I was present when the contract was signed. We spent $10 billion so far, and we've only rolled out, and we've only done about a quarter of the project in four years. Trinan Bego is listed as 100. If, if you try to pay your taxes online right now, you will find that that is one rigmarole in terms of it is not, it's not, it's not easy to do. We are listed as 105th in the Ease of Doing Business Index. Talk to business people in terms of getting shipments off the port, how long it takes, what happens on average, the old question of scanning it and basically ensuring, for example, that including the goods are no contraband items and so on and so forth. Well, all of that is possible to do it electronically. But the point is that the entrenched interest on in government, for example, has not been able to do that. Right? The methodology determined to put into position, for example, for land and for, for what you call property tax was a very sophisticated methodology 
which allow people the capacity to look up to see what every house. Right now, you could do it on EBC. You plug in, you go on EBC site, put in your name, and it will tell you whether you're registered where you register to vote or not. Well, we could, should be able to do that for everything, right? So ease of doing business has to affect literally almost every area of government business. Almost every area of government business. It ought to be much easier and the systems and procedures have to be put in to ensure that it happens, right? So that the whole question of what examples of ease and doing business, we'll just do business with the government in almost anything. And you'll find out that all of these systems, if you go one day to a government department and you speak to one person and you go back on the second day, the procedure for doing it would have changed depending on the two persons you speak to. Now, would you accept that for a, from a private sector firm? You wouldn't, right? But those are the kinds of things that have to be done, right? Um, De Novo would tell you that it took them 18 months and 199 permits to get 18 months, 18 months, 18 months is, in, is the short end of it to get 199 permits to establish a, a new pipeline and a gas field. This is quite apart from doing the construction work to get it going. 18 months, right? And the number of permits from the number of different ministries was just startling. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Next, we'd like to invite Mr. Kevin Ramnarine to give his closing comments. Mr. Ramnarine. Oh, Mr. Ramnarine, I'm going to have to ask you to unmute your mic. because we Yeah, don't let me just respond to the question from Mr. Rolox, I think it was, on levelized cost of energy and how does that apply to renewables? Um, what, first of all, let's start off with what is the major obstacle to renewable energy taking off in Trinidad and Tobago? And it is the low cost of electricity, which is based on our subsidization of electricity, which is an NGC subsidy. So the, let me just state the NGC subsidizes natural gas prices for electricity. And on top of that, TN Tech does not pay NGC on a timely basis. And as I said at the beginning of the show, the Zoom call tonight, there is a big, um, a large amount of money which TN Tech owes NGC. So I'll start off with that to me as a major obstacle. However, in according to IRENA, in the period 2010 to 2017, the levelized cost of energy for solar went from 0 0.0.36 US cents per kilowatt hour um, all the way down to 10 cents. 10 US cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that, so that's, that is a, almost a fourfold drop in the cost of generating electricity using solar, right? And this, this, this data comes from IRENA, it's available online. So the, the cost of getting electricity from solar has come down significantly during the course of the last decade. And it, to me, it has now made solar competitive with natural gas derived electricity in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I know that the, I shouldn't say the former government, but the government, um, because they, you know, um, the government has engaged BP and Shell. And of course, as we said at the beginning of the program, BP and Shell are changing the way that they do business and they are moving towards renewables um, and zero carbon. But so the government has engaged with BP and Shell through a competitive, tendering process and they won the they won the rights to build uh, the first solar farm for Trinidad and Tobago. So that I assume would happen sometime within the next five years. But you are right, the levelized cost of energy as it relates to solar is now on a competitive footing with natural gas and oil and and all you know all the fossil fuels and so on. And that is what is giving life to this whole revolution in renewables, uh, particularly in Europe, um, where there's a, a lot of wind energy in Europe. And um, of course, solar being very dominant in India and China, where there's more sunshine. So renewables has uh, a place in our society. And the other, the other point I would also make is that the NGCs 
the, the burden of the NGC carrying TNTEC um, has become more apparent because the NGC is not the company it was six or seven years ago. Uh, in 2013, the NGC's after tax profits was 6.5 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars, the largest profit I think ever made by a company in the Caribbean. Um, that has come, we don't have the NGC's accounts for 2019, which is something I've made an issue of. Um, we should have that by now. But I think that when we see the 2019 accounts of the National Gas Company, we may see that they are barely profitable and certainly not the company they were back in 2013 and 2014. So their, their capacity to carry the burden of TNTEC, which is the burden of the country, is greatly diminished. And we are going to have to face this problem of TNTEC, NGC, TGU, our electricity prices at the residential, commercial, and industrial um, levels very, very soon. So um, that to me is one of the major issues that the, the, the incoming government would have to grapple with. Okay, yeah, thank you. Christian? Mr. Seely, Mr. Seely, paging Mr. Seely. <laughs> oh, apologies. Sorry. It looks like I was muted. <laughs> apologies, folks. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Ramarine. And next, we'd just like to invite Ms. Deming to make her contribution. Ms. Deming? Thank you, thank you very much, Christian. And there are two questions I want to answer. One was a question about what specifically can people, can be done to force the government's hand or to change approaches. And I have a very um, old fashioned approach. I have written 44 letters to the prime minister. I've only got six of them acknowledged. But the point is, the point is that I had a database of 44 letters that I could have published. And I feel that that old fashioned method, if a, gov if a prime minister or a minister gets a thousand letters a month from citizens, they will stand up and take action. And the second point I wanted to make is about the question about data. And I'm gonna quote from a letter that I wrote to the prime minister. And this was written in, on April 7, 2019. And it says that my April 7, 2019 letter reminded you of a campaign promise to make decisions on the basis of data and your commitment to improve, restructure, redesign the country's central statistical office. I note that in February 2016, your good friend, Dr. John Prince, was appointed chairman of the cabinet appointed task force for the establishment of the National Statistical Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm requesting an update on the status of the work of that task force. Now that letter to me, it's what I could do as a citizen because he made a campaign promise in 2015 that there would be the establishment of a task force to look at the National Institute of Statistics of Trinidad and Tobago. And I was just calling him out to say, what have you done about it? So I'm saying to citizens that we do have opportunities available to us and we need to engage. And if we engage, I think we will get a different kind of outcome. So that's my comments. Thank you very much and have a great weekend. And I hope we manage the COVID-19 so that more of us survive. Thank you very much for your contribution, Ms. Deming. Next, I'd like to invite Mr. Curtis Williams to give his closing remarks. Mr. Williams. Um, okay, so I, I, most of, I guess all of the questions that were asked were answered by uh, by the rest of the panel and that's 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 that's, that's great actually um what i would like to say is that i've heard a lot um tonight and a lot of it sounds like um that things are going to be difficult as they probably are and therefore i want to end on a, a less pessimistic mode by saying that perhaps there will be um there could be some good news i have written that i think that by uh, this i wrote this in march at the height of uh, I guess the start of the day, the crash um, in relation to COVID. And I predicted by uh, September, crude prices will be around $50 a barrel. And that next year should be about $60 a barrel. And I, st I, I still hold to that uh, position um, 
you know, all things being equal. I think if that happens, and if um, certainly next year in 2021 crude production improves because of the Ruby um, project starting in, at the end of 2021, and also uh, Heritage improving its production and, and, and um, other on land production that may come on from Touchstone. Um, then I, and, and, and Touchstone being small, but having some, some wet gas. Um, I think that I think we may have improved crude production, and certainly with Barracuda and uh, Colibri projects uh, and um, coming on, and the BP, <coughs> sorry, the BP um, compression project, Cassia C, also coming on, um, there will be more sustained and increased gas production. Uh, I know that that certainly the people who are who are the methanol producers seem to think that there's going to be some stabilization. And next year there will be probably a little bit of incremental increase in methanol um, and ammonia prices. Certainly not the kind of prices that they would want. And, and they are struggling even now um, with this use of cash flow, far less this use of profit. So, um, so they're going to be significantly challenged. Um, but if we are to be optimistic, certainly on the energy side, um, I think in a couple of years, the energy um, producers are going to be different, also are going to be in a better position. Also, if you look at the spread between um, Brent and WTI, you'd realize that spread has narrowed significantly, which tells me that the discounting of crude <coughs> is not happening as much at, at, at Cushing. Um, and, and therefore, you have, um, you have less production of crude happening and therefore less discounting of crude. And with that means less production of natural gas which is good for LNG prices, which will help in terms of the competitiveness um, in re the petrochemical sector here and, um, and, and those in the United States. So, um, but of course, there are all kinds of caveats to this, whether the world economy is going to grow, or what is going to happen to, with COVID, will there be a vaccine um, found? And um, or importantly, at what price point will shale producers come back in the market? And will those investors who've lost a lot of money over the years in shale, will they continue to pump that money into shale? Um, so those are, those are some, some of my thoughts. Um, I think that, that it's going to be difficult, but we just could get lucky and we may become even more lucky if broadside, um, the well that um, BHP is going to drill, if it becomes a game changer. So I, I'm saying that yes, um, and I know Denise must be um, you know, unhappy to hear me talk about this issue about energy, um, because I agree with her about the need to develop the human capital because and to change and to diversify the economy. But I also think that the strategy that is required is one that we develop all sectors, sectors of the economy, including the energy sector. And how do we diversify that energy sector and link it to manufacturing? Um, so on, those, on that note, I, I think all is not over. Um, there are possibilities and, um, and uh, hopefully for the country's sake um, that we, we, we are successful. Um, and that I hope that even if the energy um, sector is able to give us some more breathing space, it does not then see more breathing space to do the same thing, but rather more breathing space to allow us to diversify. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution, um, Mr. Williams. And next we'd like to invite Dr. Rod Hussein to give his closing comments. Dr. Hussein. So thank you very much, Christian. Um, you know, it's, it's really good to see at 10 past nine, so many people still on, and that's good. Um, you know, Rebecca, you should make note of that. It means that what we are doing is in demand and useful to the public of Toronto Bay. I was a little surprised, you know, I, I, I was glad to hear Curtis's um, closing comments, and I felt happy when he started off by speaking by of the good news. And then I realized he went on and on about the energy sector. And so the good news is really bad news from a diversification perspective in the sense that unless the same sector that for the last 50, 60 years makes some runs, Team Trinidad and Tobago is going to crash. And I find that, uh, of course, we will take whatever energy revenues we can generate. We say thank you. But it's very disheartening to know that 
it's almost like the same old, same old strategy and that basically we have not come out of this uh, position of, of, of heavy dependence on the energy sector. In fact, it's very, 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 very in, in, in part. One of the, what, someone asked about the ease of doing business in this and quickly, the person said they are not looking for examples. I think it was Joel. And what I would say is that Joel, one of the ways we need to look at this is we need to see, we keep looking for these quick wins. What I think we need to do is to commission a study where someone looks at the 15 best performing developing countries in the world of which five are, we take the top five best petroleum based performing countries in terms of the ease of doing business ranking. We look at the things they did in the last 15 years to improve their ease of doing business ranking. We pick from that list the lowest hanging subsets that try and Tobago we have not implemented as yet, and then we execute on that. And we have been talking over and over about this situation since 2014. And as Mariano mentioned, there's really a lack of political will. And so how do we get that political will going? And this ties in with a very important point, certainly one of the most important points we have denied by Professor Anthony Gonzalez, which is the polarization that has taken place in the recent part as measured by uh, some of the racist comments being made. And notice that I emphasize as measured because we now have a measurement platform in terms of some of the racist comments being made, but it means that somewhere in it somewhere underneath there is this type of thinking and the real challenge for whichever government event, whichever party eventually forms the next government of Toronto Bigo, is how do you bridge that gap between the different groups in Toronto Tobago to encourage a more maximal type of participation. Do you, for example, create a direct role for two to three people from the opposition on, on in, in some way in direct directly participating in the governance process. I say that, for example, because I see Guyana uh, made a gesture towards Minister Jordan to stay on as one of the people working with the new government in Guyana. And finally, I would say to Ms. Antonia Ferrier is, I understand your data concern. There's very little, um, little data available, but if you look at something called WITS, or trade can, you, you can get some data in terms of imports. Now, I know it wouldn't answer your production question of, say, for example, bottled water, but you will get an example or an idea of the import market and the size of the import market, which you could perhaps use as a some sort of gauge to help you with your SME planning. I know I am not answering you, but I'm telling you about the only place that I know some pockets of the information is available. So in saying that, uh, we would, I would say thank you for the time and, and I would turn back to Christian. Thank you very much for your uh, closing comments, Dr. Hussein. Um, to all our panelists, we want to say thank you very much for joining us this evening and also for our audience who stayed with us um, for the entire time that we've been having these really important discussions on the economic realities that will be facing us over the next five years. So thank you very much for joining us and do have a good night. Stay safe. Remember to socially distance, wear your mask and keep washing your hands. Thank you very much and have a good night, everyone.